Hi everyone, it's me, and today let's discuss this horror together. Let's start. <laughs> The back room, all yellow, running away from something, I guess. I'm guessing running away from a, a creature, a monster, a horror. The horror. You're hiding it now? What's that? Okay. What's that? Are you safe now? Oh my god! <laughs> the editor for the for the film Terry. <laughs> film Terry. Hello internet, welcome to film theory. The sh Hello internet, welcome to film theory. Hi, let's start. Show that reminds you that all the creepiest pastas came from the 1980s. Hulk Hogan, he's got pasta mania in the Mall of America. I want to try to get a word with him. Pasta mania, he's got all my Hulkamaniacs running wild. And I've eaten so many Hulkaroos and Hulkyus, I kind of feel sorry. Fun fact, that restaurant would go on to receive three Michelin stars. Well, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> I hope you carbo-loaded on that pasta mania, Hulkamaniacs. Because tonight we're no clipping once more into the back rooms the analog horror series right here on YouTube produced by Kane pixels last time we thank you so much camp yourself thank you so much wandered through these jaundiced hallways we were looking for a means of escape a way to survive the endless maze of humming fluorescence and soggy carpets but today we're looking for something different we're looking for lore specifically we want answers at this point Kane's series is three months old and in that amount of time he's given us 10 videos full of creepy mysteries for us to choose on. What are the back rooms, really? Did humanity create them? Have they just been a parallel dimension all along? And what about the dead man that we find hidden in the middle of the maze covered in a violent explosion of black? Who is this guy? What is this guy? And most importantly of all, should we be concerned about that monster roaming the halls? Uh, probably, right? Usually a giant roaring threat is something to be concerned about. So throw yeah. on your hazmat suits, friends, and grab your toe lines. Today, we're going in deep. Well, let's start. I'm sorry. Let's start. <laughs> First, let's talk about timeline, shall we? Part of what makes the lore of the back room so hard to crack in an initial watch is that it follows the tried and true formula of series like The Walton Files, Mandela Catalog, and FNAF, where the story is just told out of order. The very first upload of the series, Back Rooms Found Footage, actually comes last in the timeline currently, September 23rd, 1996. So, through the power of reorganization, let's recap what we know in the order that we know it. Our story begins in 1982 with a Async, a corporation conducting scientific research into magnetism and or electromagnetic field generators under government contract during the Cold War. In our first video of the series, Prototype, a video that, no joke, released as I was writing this paragraph, so forgive me if I miss anything in it, we get our yeah. first event of the series. A metallic marble is surrounded by what appears to be electromagnetic field generating tubes. Notice how the Ooh. shape and general design matches diagrams for similar real-life generators. The system fires up, and just like that, the ball is gone. Presumably teleported ported to some space within space, thereby making the ball a subspace emissary, if you will. Oh! I hate myself for that joke, but then again- <laughs> The super smash! <laughs> Well, okay, and yeah, you don't done. pass up the opportunity to make the very rare subspace emissary joke. Anyway, by July of 1988, Async, emboldened by that initial success, has given their distortion field experiments a room-sized glow-up called Project KV-31. <laughs> According to the video The Third Test, the goal of these experiments was to solve, quote, all future storage and housing needs. So it seems like the foundation of our story here is that science discovers an entire other universe of endless space, and our first thought was, hey, it's a good place to store our junk. In total, Async <laughs> Sync conducts Sorry. five failed tests to try and open a portal to this subspace before the sixth finally proves successful. On October 17th, 1989 at 5.04 p.m. Pacific, with the generator beefed up and something redacted being introduced into something else redacted, the threshold gets cranked up and blasts out a light show that seems to almost shake the facility apart. When the smoke clears, the back rooms themselves have finally appeared on the other end. Async has achieved first contact. Unfortunately, that's not the only thing that happened. That date and time, 5.04 p.m. on October 17th, 1989, also happened to be, in reality, the moment of magnitude 6.9, lol, hit the central- 
<laughs> Get it? 69? 69 earthquake? <laughs> Come on. The coast of California, killing 63 and injuring thousands more. The timing here is clearly not meant to be a coincidence, as a secret unlisted video on Kane Pixel's channel gives us real archival news footage from the Loma Prieta quake, including a map highlighting the location of the earthquake's epicenter, the Santa Cruz Mountains. In short, we now know where our async test facility is hidden. It's here, the epicenter of that devastating quake. And from that point forward, the world appears to be glitched. We see in the video missing persons that from October 1980, onward, huge numbers of ordinary people just start to go missing as they know missing, clip through missing, reality, missing. falling into this newly opened backrooms meta space. All the A lot of innocent civilians. <sighs> yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. While Async is slowly exploring this new environment. On February 3rd, 1990, they have their first major discovery. A mysterious dead body coated in what appears to be some type of black mold or aged blood splatter. So first deadly sorry first little casualty yeah. so far in the series he remains as an unidentified john doe but my suspicion is that this is actually nicholas bolton a missing person that we see at the top of the upload notice hey, a few of the details here first he's not wearing a hazmat suit which clearly uh -huh. tells us that this is not an async employee instead it's someone who no clipped into the back rooms second no compare their physical appearances notice the wider nose tall forehead the hoodie just like we see on nicholas's missing poster yep. around this same time we also see that async's government contract appears to have been canceled in the next video autopsy report we get quick cuts of various images on a screen one image here is the top line of a document with the words contract termination things aren't looking too great for async and they're about to get worse just shy of one month later the fourth member of an async exploration crew is lured away from the rest by mysterious voices in the walls and ceiling only to see his team glitch out of space when he tries to rejoin them you guys can you hear this hey guys can you hear this hey um. Ta -da. guys GG, man. GG. Now lost, he wanders the hallways, stumbling Gigi. across a bizarre theater with burned remains in the middle of the floor, as well as a smaller crawl space with non-carpeted floors, forest print wallpaper, and the facade of a house with farm equipment out front. As he continues his search, we see what looks to be an exit into an async control room, considering his keycard works on the door and his sounds of relief. But it winds up empty, and his presence <sighs> triggers a red alert. End huh? of upload. About a week later, on March 5th, async rigs cameras to motion sensors to capture the action of what's going on in the back rooms while people aren't there. We see async crew members constructing more walls. Oh. Yeah, cause that's what the back rooms needed. More rooms. <laughs> Humanity, you dumb. Later that night at 3am, the cameras capture a bizarre dark shape that seems to be moving along the walls or the ceiling. Looks like the back rooms monster's been watching some YouTube videos. Don't explore the back rooms at 3am. Asterisk scary. Asterisk you will cry. Asterisk shooketh. Which then brings us all the way back to the first ever upload, Kane's original found footage video. In 1996, a young cinematographer named Kane no clips through the ground, falling into the back rooms, where he encounters some kind of monster that attacks and presumably kills him, sending his camera falling through yet another clip and back out into reality. If you go frame by frame during this moment, you can actually see Kane's whole body here being attacked by the monster as the camera falls. It's a very cool little detail that I noticed. So anyway, that's the story that we've gotten thus far, but it leaves plenty of major questions for us to speculate about what wait a minute first do you see the height of it if you fall from that height you are bound to be dead gosh the nature of the back rooms. What is the monster roaming the halls? Why are there voices and farmhouses hidden inside the walls? Well, let's start with the monster. Is it human? Doesn't appear to be. You can probably also eliminate animal and bird. An insect? Nah. Maybe some kind of robot? It looks a little bit like one if you squint, but then again, I've always got animatronics on the brain, so I'm a little bit biased. I've seen some people suggest that it could be a ghost or an energy monster. No. Energy monster. Not monster energy. Regardless Yes, I know, I know, I know, I know. Energy monster! Monster energy! Yep. Regardless, we can eliminate both options because it has a physical form. It is able to throw objects and grab Kane. No, I think the back rooms has already told us what this thing is. It's a mutated bacteria. Now, I know, bacteria are supposed uh, to be really small, literally microorganisms, whereas the back rooms uh, monster microbes. is anything but. However, one thing that bacteria love to do is form colonial organisms, animals that are actually groups of smaller animals all Voltron together. TLDR, I think that is what we're looking at here. A colonial organism composed 
composed of bacteria, possibly one that's been further mutated by exposure to human DNA, specifically a mutated strain of hay bacillus. That may seem specific, but there's a definite reason for it. You see, after Async discovers the mysterious dead body, they conduct an mm -hmm. autopsy report on it, confirming that it's been decayed at uneven rates due to having been overtaken by a mutated strain of bacteria. It's like portions of the body stopped decaying and, and were sustained. I took uh, a couple samples of some of the material here. It seems to be closer to a mutated strain of simple hay bacillus. It should be completely benign, but really, I, I, I don't know what to make of this. Well, don't worry, Doc, because I do. You see, hay bacillus, also known as Bacillus subtilis, is pretty darn common, living in places like the human and cow digestive systems. It's a rod-shaped bacteria that's generally mm -hmm. pretty harmless, and science harmless. loves these little guys. It's used a lot in experiments because it's very easy to genetically modify. This is one of the all-purpose cultures you'll find in almost any lab using bacteria for research because it's durable, it's manipulable, and it adapts in a very elastic way. And because it's so strong and resilient, it's been used to test out extreme environments environments like outer space, which I call out because later in the video autopsy report, we see that quick montage of images I mentioned earlier, and it includes close-ups of bacteria cultures along with rocket and space imagery, all case and points, extreme environments seeming to relate to this very idea. Oh yeah, and it's also been used by the military. Between 1950 huh. and 1970, the US Army released aerosolized bacteria believed to be harmless over populated areas of the country without telling anyone. All to what study what the impact might look like if an enemy ever tried something similar. Another test was conducted on the New York subway system in 1966, utilizing our little hay bacteria. They kind of just dumped it in through the sewer grates and people <laughs> dusted it off their shoulders. Here's the thing, Army. When you're on a New York subway, the biggest biological threat isn't the sketchy bacteria powder that you're dumping on us. It's the guy <laughs> open mouth packing into my face during rush hour. Anyway, all this about durability and space and genetic mutation makes me think that our monster is a walking, roaring bacteria culture surviving in the back rooms and evolving by coming into contact with the humans that keep no clipping in. And that's not just speculation either. Kane has seemed to confirm parts of this. Recently on his Ko-Fi account, which is basically like his Patreon, he dropped this picture of the monster explicitly labeled as bacteria. Something tells me you're gonna need some more than antibiotics to kill that bacterial infection. Now that is what I call biological warfare. So that's a little bit about the monster, but then what are the back rooms themselves? What exactly are they and what's their nature telling us about the world this story is set in? Well, when talking about internet urban legends to base a video series around, the back rooms is still- That's very true. What are the back rooms? Pretty new. The original meme dates to 2019. The lore and branching ARGs all come up later, and these videos have all gone up in the last few months. This is a brand new evolving concept, but the bigger idea that it's grounded in, that the world we know has secret hollow spaces behind the scenes that we aren't supposed to enter, sure. that idea goes way back into ancient mythology and folklore, probably as old as the human psyche itself. The ancient Greeks believed that spirits of the dead and plenty of other things inhabited an entire underworld of caves and caverns. The 19th century French occultist Joseph Alexandre Saint-Yves Marquis de Levendre, how's that for a name, wow. advanced what he claimed was evidence of an wow. inner world inside the huh. earth itself called Agartha that some people still think is a thing today. Even the idea of just ordinary maintenance tunnels and access shafts all over the world being connected to huh. a more sinister purpose was part of the background mythology in Jordan Peele's horror movie oh, Us. Yes, yes, yes. Us. It's a very familiar looking wallpaper. But of them all, The Back Rooms is probably most similar to the work of mid 20th century sci fi horror creator Richard Matheson. He wrote the stories that inspired I Am Legend and The Incredible Shrinking Man, as well as many, many episodes of Star Trek and Twilight Zone, including the. In yes, that's right. I Am Legend with Will Smith. <laughs> hey! Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry. Miss Gremlin on the Wing episode with William Shatner. But perhaps most importantly for us today, he wrote Little Girl Lost, an episode of The Twilight Zone that was so iconic it would be parodied by The Simpsons years later in one of their Halloween episodes using really expensive for the time 3D animation. It's like, uh, 
Did anyone see the movie Tron? No. 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 I mean, no. In both versions of the story, a character accidentally finds themselves passing through an imperceptible rift between our dimension and another, unable to find their way out, getting lost in a vast, confusing, repetitive maze. Sound familiar? Really similar to the idea of falling into the back rooms. In fact, the only real difference between all these stories is the terminology involved. For the original Backrooms lore, they say that you've no-clipped through reality, a phrase borrowed from video games to describe when solid graphical elements pass oh. through one another in a way that the program doesn't intend, resulting in a player character yeah, ending yeah, up yeah. in an empty space um, outside of the quote-unquote level box. This some Yeah, it's like there's a glitch in the level box, especially if there's like a 3D level, 3D game. Sometimes allows you to skip around and cheat, especially when you're talking about older games when developers were still figuring out how to make 3D work. Now, Kane Pixels' Back Rooms has yet to make any explicit reference to this. We have never heard the phrase no clipping, and we have not once seen no any references to video games or digital worlds. In fact, Kane's series has taken the general concept of the Back Rooms mm -hmm. and layering on a science fiction rationale to ground it in a very believable reality. And yet, the video game stuff? I think this is exactly what he's building towards. And the key is right here at 5. 545 in the very first upload. Check out the rope. It's sitting there. Just Ew. sitting right there. Ew. At first, I thought nothing of it. It's just garbage on the ground, whatever. But then, one month later, we get this at the midpoint of informational uh -huh. video. As the lost async employee explores the smaller crawl space with forest wallpaper, he stumbles across the facade of a farmhouse, and near it is this. An axe leaning against the wall. Again, a singular object just sitting there alone waiting to get picked up. So, we're wandering through a maze made of geometric shapes and repeating textures. Stalked by a monster, and random useful objects are just sitting there out in the open on the ground, waiting to get picked up. No real context around them. It looks a lot to me like a video game. The kind of video game you might no clip. That's very true. Why are they there? Why? in or out of. To me, this whole area with the tree texture wallpaper, the facade of a house on the wall, the random old-time farm tools that just look slightly geometrically off, this looks like the exact way older 3D video games, I'm talking PlayStation 1 era, would use polygons and flat textures to try and render outdoors and nature settings within level box designs. They would paint the walls to look like trees. They would paper the sky blue with textures. They would stick a house facade onto a giant rectangle to surround the door that they want you to go into. Check out the wheelbarrows, specifically Specifically, the shadows of the wheelbarrows. Notice how they don't really move or shift position as the bright flashlight beam moves? Well, this certainly could be just 3D animation issues. It also reflects how many early video games couldn't or didn't use dynamic shaders. Ooh. Shadows, if they existed at all, tended to be fixed and painted onto textures. This saved on processing power, but also gave objects a bit of a flat look. There's even a point where our async employee- With the illusion of having a shadow. Illusion, of course. He leans in close to the wheelbarrows where it looks like the wallpaper pixel smears into just color lines. Again, like you'd see in a video game with texture mapping on the fritz. So if the back rooms is indeed the space you go to when you no-clip through the ground, like we see Kane do in episode one, then we're looking at evidence that reality itself on our side of the threshold is also a simulation. It could very well be that this whole series is just a modern take on the Matrix, a simulation that no one realizes they're in. And when Async opens the door to the back rooms, they're finding a storage area for the extra unused assets, the procedurally generated worlds, the levels that just haven't quite made the cut yet. As Kane explores the various levels in the series' mm -hmm. first upload, we see office supplies and warehouses, but also residential-style yeah. railings and exteriors of buildings that huh. are clearly indoors. Hardwood floors, repeating filing cabinets, it's a mishmash of random assets, like when you're exploring a library of 3D assets from something like a game engine. All of reality being a simulation would also explain the voices that lure the yes. async employee away in an informational video. Listen to the sound. These aren't voices that are explicitly trying to lure him away. It's not sinister in any way. It's just general white noise of a busy office or a party, almost as though reality is breaking through. While he's wandering around in a simulation on a computer, an office party is going on one layer of reality up. But outside of the wall textures and random objects just sitting out in the open like a video game, there's one piece of evidence that really clinches it for me. Something that gets me to raise my eyebrow. Notice the date on this upload. February 29th, 1990. Here's the mind blow. That can't be correct. There is no such day in existence. Oh my gosh, that's true. There is no 29th of February on that particular year. 
Huh. February has 28 days, and 1990 was not a leap year. Hey. Sussy baka. To me, this wasn't a mistake. Kane already picked first contact to happen on a day when a major real-world earthquake occurred. The dates in this series matter. It tells me that we're existing in a reality different from our own. One where a February 29th, 1990 can exist. A simulated reality. And the back rooms is the boundary between worlds, where the separation becomes just a little bit thinner, allowing things like office voices and, who knows, maybe even a virulent bacteria into the simulation. Am I right? Will async be able to break through the boundary? I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Very interesting. It's kind of dark, but very interesting. Very creative as well, actually, if you think about it. Very extremely sorry. Extremely. <laughs> oh my god, I was like, come on, man, the horror scare, the jump scare. Well, anyways, thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you find this video very interesting to watch. If you do like this video, please show me to like, share, and subscribe to my channel, and comment down below if you have any share of us. Down below, down below, down below, down below. Don't forget to follow my channel, and I hope to see you all in my next video. But hey, that's just a theory. A film. Is it a film theory? Yeah, sorry. But hey, that's just a theory, a film theory. Thanks for watching. Thank you. And I hope to see you all in my next video. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Subscribe. Thank you. Oh <laughs> yeah. Really appreciate that all of you are being so genuinely sincere, thoughtful, engage, engaging, encouraging, positive, and so wholesome. Thank you so much. You're the best. You're all the best. Thank you.